Nikolai Frederick Severin Grundtvig, part two. Last time we spoke about Grundtvig's position in society in his context. This time I will try to emphasize a bit more on his presence, or rather our presence, and his influence on it. Is Grundtvig still around? I believe so. We learned the last time that Gondui was a product of the consequences of the Industrial Revolution. And we were focusing on the period from his birth, 1783, and until he became a household brand. We're talking about the 1840s, 50s. We also focused on what happened on right up until his death in 1872. However, Grundtvig is quite a special character. What was it that made him so incredible? That's also a thing we discussed the last time. He was a product of a context that focused on setting things free. The consequences of developing and developing and developing. It's a bit, little bit like our tech revolution today and the technological revolution we had in the, around the 2000s. We saw a lot of new things appearing, and we also saw a philosophical reaction to it. And I believe that Gondwe represents that re philosophical reaction to his, to his time. Gondwe represented, as you can see, the living word. I put him together with our good friend, Mr. Martin Luther, who whom we celebrate for his 100 years of reforming the Catholic Church to this year, 2017. The reason I do that is because Grundtvi actually did the same thing. He just didn't use paper and he had no nails, so he didn't put anything up on any barn or a church door. What he said was something entirely different. He said that from this day and back, we have all been focusing on the written word. From this day and forth, we should change our emphasis to the spoken word. That was more or less his message. And thereby, he went into not a drastic conflict with the ongoing political observations in time, uh, but he de was definitely not popular with the church of his day. That was because he advocated the living word. And in his mind, in the early 1800s and up to 1820, 30-ish, that meant the living faith. He believed that every man has the right to define his own perception of Christianity. And every man needs this definition to be able to communicate with Christianity and with God. To Gauntry, it was all a matter of the sacrament. To the church, the national church of Denmark, it was all a matter of the catechismus. It was all a matter of Luther's written word. Where Gauntry said, we have to put it into context. We have to do, make, it re, make it living. We have to say what happens, what goes on now. Rather, what went on when they wrote it in 1517. So Grundtvig, based on that, was the advocate of a debate culture. We need to talk about things. We must ask ourselves, though, if such a culture at all exists, or indeed ever has existed. I think that's a very good question. Let's start by defining the term debate in the first place. The word itself stems from the ancient French, Debattre, which actually means to fight or to come from a fight. The phrase indicates that we have two or more opposing views that have it out verbally. Well, verbally, <laughs> that comes later, but that at least have a falling out of some sort. A little later on, most likely in the 15th century, it became synonymous with this exchange of opinion 
in an organized and structured manner so we could actually discuss things without tearing each other's heads off. Which is quite a good idea, by the way. And as a means of controlled exchange of views, not only for the privileged, but for anyone who could master this skill of debating. So, and now against rather Grundvigian, in the academic world, as well as in any other world, based on an inequality due to internal power structure and hierarchy, much debate is amputated by fear. We're quite, quite afraid of everything. We're fear reprisals from those above us in an organization, organizational hierarchy. We fear that we might jeopardize our academic credibility if we launch new ideas. We're afraid to say things if the wrong people hear it. Now, what do we mean by that? It means that we are constantly observing how am I positioning myself in a social context. We have created a culture of you can't say exactly what you want, despite the fact that we have constitutions that guarantee us the right to say everything we want. And this is not a new idea. This idea of fear of positioning, fear of social gain and uh, fear of our personal social context is as old as mankind. So, instead of what he wanted, a society based on free thought, free spirits, the desire to say exactly what you want because you're not afraid of being hit or killed that's not what he had, and that's not what he saw. He saw a society based on, I can't say what I want. I don't have any free spirit. And I'm afraid that if I say what I do want, I'll be killed. Not necessarily physically, but socially. I'll end up a very dead person. This picture of Grundtvig is quite a, a precise one. Have a look at the color of the sleeves here. We have a red sleeve and a blue sleeve. That is because both sides want to be part of his legacy. Both socialists or social democrats as we know them here in these uh, parts of the world <laughs> want to take charge and take credit for Grundtvig's words when it comes down to education. It's education for the masses with the emphasis here on mass masses. The blue sleeves, and I know it's the other way around in the United States, but the blue sleeves here represent uh, the capitalists, the reactionists, the conservatives. And they too, and the new liberals, they too want to take charge of him. They want to take credit for his views on personal freedom. Oh, have a look, he said. We all have to be free. We all have to mind our own business. That's what we stand for. Here the emphasis is on freedom rather than the masses. So both sides take out bits and pieces of Kondvi's ideology and make it their own. That's interestingly enough the case, and it still is the case. Gondry was heavily engaged in politics, and if we look at the priority issues, we reach the, at least for the majority of Danes, rather surprising conclusion that Gondry actually was a liberal. He wasn't very much into masses. He didn't care very much for nature as such. His view on nature was, it's made by God, let's tend to our own business. He supports the freedom of citizens in society above anything else. And he was very much afraid of big black boxes of municipalities, of authority, of controlling factors that we do not have an influence on. And he went to England between 1829 and 1831. And what he saw there and what he heard there was John Locke, John Smith. He heard about, and Adam Smith, sorry. He heard about them all. He heard about Liberty. He heard about libertarians. Heard about, I can do whatever I want, I can say whatever I want, as long as I'm not hurting anyone. It's a little like the Norwegian author, Torbjörn Eina, and his Kademomabu law. Quite interesting. As long as you 
are good to everyone, and you don't bother everyone. You can do roughly as you like and as you please. And that is the view of quantity. For that very reason, he opposed the Danish 1848 constitution very harshly and heavily. Not because it introduced freedom, and not because it introduced the universal right to vote, but because it imposes limitations upon this very right. You couldn't vote if you had a record, if you owed money to everyone. You couldn't vote at all. Actually, you had to have a fortune, and you had to be male. Then you could vote. And to him, that was not a true, a true universal right to vote. That's restrictions on the right to vote. And to him, that was nonsense. He was not into... Uh, the, 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 he was not into women politics. He was not into Red Sox. He was not into suffragettes. He was not into women's labors and all that stuff at all. He had sympathy for them, though. He met a very young activist called Mathilde Fiebiger. We have a street here at Oldbrook University named up after her. And he, he felt quite sympathetic for their cause because he believed in absolute freedom. Another thing he believed in was the absolute right and the absolute freedom to choose your own religion. He was not into Judaism. He was not into Islam. He was not into Christianity. He couldn't care less as long as you do good. If you have it in your heart to do good, you can't be all that far off. Those were his thoughts. Interesting, actually, when we look about today's present world. And that brings us off uh, on to a very interesting question. Why would the presence of gold and glory represent any form of guarantee of honesty and the ability to rule in the first place? That's his question. How come that we put an equation mark between I have a million, consequently I must be a very good ruler? Of course he did that because, and they did that because, it seemed obvious. If he can make a million, he must be a good person. Doesn't say somewhere in the Bible if you sow a couple of coins, you'll get more. Um, that at least was the reason that it was accepted as a general idea of success. And if you are successful, it must be because God loves you. Ergo, you must be a good person. But as he also saw it, what about the poor Samaritan? The poor Samaritan comes along and helps somebody he doesn't know. Is that not really true altruism? Is that not really true caring and compassion? He was definitely silenced about that one. But those were his claims. He claimed that these factors of richness and goodness are not automatically connected, and he points to his personal observations that many a poorer man has shown many a richer man compassion, and therefore ambition for the many. That is in itself a very interesting observation which needs to be taken into account. And rather brings us back to the education system. As previously stated, Grundtvig absolutely hated the traditional education system as of the early 1800s. We've learned that he did himself graduate from the school in Aarhus, the Latin school in Aarhus, it was a classical Latin school, around the year 1800. He was quite content. And it was only later on that he discovered that it actually made him a bastard. <laughs> it made him not a better person, and he wanted to become a better person. Better person defined as someone, as someone who takes part in society, and to some extent tries to live up to the Christian idea of compassion, and helping thy neighbour. So, his idea of the living word was originally strictly directed at the de definition of Christianity, as previously mentioned. But, in the mid-1830s, he was struck by lightning as it dawned on him that this thing about the spoken word, the living word, might actually be just what the education system needs. This may be what we're all waiting for. And it dawned on him why he didn't get as much out of his school time as he would have wanted. That was because it was all about the written word. That doesn't necessarily mean that whoever tells you the written word understands the written word. 
There was no debate. There was no asking questions. There was no nothing. Today's Olborg University would have turned in its grave had it heard about this kind of education. And that is exactly why he opposed it. We need to talk. We need to debate. We need to realize that no education is absolute. No fact is absolute. No truth is absolute. We need to question all these absolutistic facts in order to reach new truths. And that was his conclusion. And not long after he had this fantastic uh, struck of lightning, he made the foundation for his public school system. It was a high school system, but based on his ideas. He published a manual to be, to be used by the school system in whatever manner they saw fit. But in all his material, he emphasized the importance of the use of oral reproduction of knowledge. Not written, but oral. You use the written words, word as a supplementary source of data. So, if you reach some sort of conclusion, you write it down. You save it for your next man. But you keep evolving your facts around the spoken word. Rather like debate culture today, if that exists. I do believe that it exists, but I do also believe it needs to be revived. We need to reinvent it, and we, we need to reintroduce it into our education system. I think Olborg and perhaps Roskilde are some of the few places where this is actually taking place. We do have debate going on. We do have work in groups, and we don't just sit there and drink coffee. We actually discuss what we're going to do for the next term, or what we're going to do with this project. And this exchange of information alone sets the standard for new data being found. And that is exactly what he wanted. One might de debate, or at least discuss, if we could go further. There's no doubt we can go further with it. We can go much further, because he also said, what do we want to do with all this lecturing? So I am indeed a paradox. I'm so sorry for that. But what do we want with all this lecturing? Why do we just sit for hours and listen to somebody babbling on? There's no debate. There's no real questioning this authority who stands here and represents the absolute truth. You could argue that that's, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. That depends on the lecturer. And we do have some quite good ones. But he has a point. And this brings us to Grundtvig today and a series of questions that all needs to be addressed. Firstly, one might ask why Grundtvig was met with such, so much resistance if he was so popular. That's a very good question. Well, one thing is that he opposed the existing system. He said, you guys are wrong. And he didn't do it very subtly. He opposed it quite heavily. He was very unpopular with the elite in his present day, mainly with the political elite. He was considered a person that grumbled, and he was a real querulous. He was always there saying, uttering harsh sounds, as opposed to this representation of absolutism, this representation of, I know the truth, you know nothing. And he hated that a lot. He made quite a few, uh, he tr had quite a few things passed for laws, but he also tried to impose new laws, many of which were rejected simply because they were not formulated in a sufficiently correct manner. He used very simple language, and he did that because he wanted everybody to understand what he has written. This was very often rejected by the others in the sitting parliament simply because it was considered crude. This very well might be the reason that not much of Grundtvig's views on education or on many other things for that matter had been allowed to prevail. We still say that we have schools based on Grundtvig and one of his interpreters, Christian Kott. However, is that really true? If we look at our normal everyday school system, 
there's not much debate going on until you reach the 8th, ninth, or 10th grade for that matter. I do think that we have some boarding schools in the 10th grade that really do it well. There you can talk about the free spirit and the, the free mind and the debate culture. The rest of the system, however, is based on, here's a book, learn. A lot of curriculative approaches to education. Not a lot of play and not a lot of talk. I think what has survived is this public high school system. And even today it seems to be as strong as ever. There has been a silent baton, however, going on between those who believe in free education, the free mind, and those who believe in measuring education. And this latter movement, no doubt, finds its parent in the prevalence of the political right. After the introduction of Thatcherism, Reaganism, and the thereby hailed idea of new public management, based on which we seem to think that measuring secures quality. If you measure things, they, they get better. Simply because if we, have to, if we quantify things and measure them, we can turn them into products and make them open for competition. It's this commodification of society that obstructs our possibility to observe clearly. At least that is the opinion of this lecture. And we, tame, we tend to team up with our new friend, Adrenaline, and his mate, Cortisol. And why do we do that? Because if you look at people and observe them all the time, and they will feel that they're being observed, what do you get? You get stress. You press people for results. You press them to try and get them to do things your way, otherwise you'll be hit by someone. So, it's a society based on, I look at you, and if you don't do what I expect you to do, you're dead. So, what do we get out of that? We get fear, as I, as I said before. Measuring things may not necessarily be bad, but as it is right now, we seem to use it quite destructively, and it turns into a weapon instead of a tool. And this causes a society of fear, rather than a society of trust and hope. I'd like to quote Roosevelt for a change. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He said that in a speech directly connected to the consequences of the Great Depression in 1929. And uh, the prevalence of the Second World War. Today, there are more than 600 Grundtvig based public high schools all over the world. Further, there's a, a complete university in Japan, the Tokai University, s founded by Dr. Shigyoshi Matsumai who based most of his educational life on Grundtvig's ideas and teachings following a visit to Denmark in 1935. So, he does definitely exist. He lives on. The next lecture will tell Mr. Matsumai's amazing story. So, thank you very much for your time. We're looking very much forward to do this again. This has been a presentation of uh, a wide closet production produced by mobile video Paul Gronkia. Thank you.